Welcome to this talk. Today, I'm going to walk you through some of the production advances in different business domains within Groundforce. I will take you to a closer look on the practical side on what the challenges we are facing on our daily life and what are our thoughts on how to deal with, it, uh, deal with them. So I'm Li Shui Jing, and I'm a senior data scientist working in Groundforce Denmark at the moment. Before we are jumping right into the topic today, let me have a quick self-introduction. So I finished my bachelor's degree in electronic and information engineering in China before I moved to Sweden, Gothenburg to get my master's degree in signal processing for wireless communication. Then, then I moved to Orbo, Denmark to do research on statistic, you know, statistical signal processing for 4G and 5G wireless communication. And since 2017, I joined the Ground Force as a senior data scientist to work with different data science problems within different business domains. So that's all about me. So next, I'm going to jump right into the main content for today. So in the background here, you can see the founder of Ground Force, Paul Jensen, and the first pump that established the Ground Force as the main player into, uh, in the pump business. In Groundforce, uh, we committed uh, to pioneer solutions to the world's water and climate challenges and improve the quality of life for people. Today, I'm going to touch three uh, parts in, our in my talk. So the first uh, part is a uh, quick flying on uh, Groundforce uh, facts and uh, why Groundforce is uh, embarking on the digital transformation journey. And the second part, I will focus more on the methodologies and practices we use in order to ramp up AI in production. And the third part, I will focus on two business use cases where we use deep learning and machine learning in order to deliver business intelligence. So in this talk, if you think about the AI in ground force, then it will not be a general AI. It will be more narrow definition of AI, means that we automate machine learning and deep learning solutions that enables a better business intelligence. So this is a, a quick overview on Groundforce. Groundforce is a number one pump manufacturer in the world. And this year is uh, its uh, 75th year's uh, anniversary. And it has a rather large footprint uh, across the world. It has uh, 83 sales companies in different continents. And each year it produces about 16 million uh, units and with a turnover around 3.4 billion euros. Worldwide, it has more than 19,000 employees and is actually a private owned company. And here you can see one picture on the uh, Ground Force headquarters building. And this is the one, and this pump is one of the very popular circulate pumps that is installed in households. So if you go to your utility room, perhaps you can see pumps like this that is used for circulating water around in your house to provide water for brushing teeth and cooking, etc. So according to a study, pump actually consumes about 10% of the world's electrical energy. And this is a very significant number. And this is also one of the main reasons that drive the ground force to develop innovative and energy efficient solutions. So if we can apply state-of-art ground force pumps, and this in principle could be reduced by 4%. Historically, ground force, uh, the core business is on pumps and the systems and the spare parts with simple services to its customers. Actually, ground force has a long journey uh, with the digital uh, with digital capabilities, but uh, in recent years, digital transformation has become uh, of uh, critical importance in ground force. So this brings uh, the new core in ground force, so that that is uh, capable of developing and uh, bringing to market a combination of physical and digital products and services. In this new core, pump system and solutions, uh, they will equip it with connectivity and the sensors. So this enables us to do advanced digital offering and the services, and also triggers new business models. For example, water as a service or performance driven contracts, etc. So that's a very quick flying on some facts on ground force and why we 
uh, focus on the digital transformation these days. And next part, I'm going to show you some of the methodologies and practices we use in order to ramp AI, ramp, ramping up AI in production. So in Grownforce, uh, we adopt a hybrid data science model, meaning that uh, we have a group of data scientists and data, data engineers uh, seated in, in a function called the Center of Excellence. And there are also uh, data scientists sitting in different uh, business domains, for example, in finance, in uh, operations, and uh, business development, et cetera. There are a couple of key uh, um, components that we are trying to build within Grownforce. So the first one is the data lake, which is uh, guided by the FIRE principle. FIRE stands for uh, findable, accessible, interoperable, interoperable, and reusable. We also um, aim to build the big, build a big data platform so that it can enable us to um, to provide the infrastructure to deliver the intelligence to either our customers or our business stakeholders within Grownforce. And we also focus quite a lot on um, building the analytics and AI capabilities in Grownforce. For example, we have quite a, a good knowledge on general AI, machine learning, deep learning, reinforcement learning, etc. cetera, these uh, techniques. And these different pillars, uh, they come together when we carry out the digital pilot projects. So there are also uh, another uh, very key uh, aspect when we do analytics projects here. So that's uh, these three uh, playbooks. So we have uh, the playbooks on data assets, uh, analytic assets, and pipeline assets. So the data assets define how do we deal with the raw data, how do we do, do data modeling, and how do we do ontologies, et cetera. And the analytics assets will focus on how do we uh, productionize uh, uh, machine learning and deep learning solutions, and how, and how do we interact with uh, different business domains when we do such a project. And the pipeline assets will become a glue to these two play playbooks where it can connect the data to business intelligence and orchestrate the infrastructure in order to, uh, to make the whole solution. So everything starts from data. And the ground force is also uh, the case. And I cannot emphasize enough that you know, building a solid data foundation is uh, how, how important is that is that. So here we use the fair Q uh, framework, and here the Q stands for quality. And there are a couple of tools we use in Grownforce in order to realize this. So we use data, tech, uh, data catalog to build a holistic view on what kind of data sources we have and uh, what are the relationships between these uh, data. And we aim to build a standard data layer so that the data can be much easier for the business analyst and the business users to consume. We also come up with data process assessment and data quality assessment method in order to guarantee the data quality. So here, uh, give you an overview on how the data process uh, is done in Grownforce. So typically, the data are connected from the sensors or from digital touch points or internal operations. And then these sensors will be joined uh, together in the, in the data lake. Uh, which is under the fire principle, and then after that, and it, it will uh, we, we we can clean the data and transform the data when necessary, and do the right modeling ontologies, etc. When that is ready, and the business can come up with a request, and we can set up the analytic team in order to um, validate whether the solution can be done or not. So here in this value chain, the data assets playbook and the analytic asset book and the pipeline uh, um, playbook, they are connected together. So we focus quite a lot on, uh, on the quality of the data. And uh, in fact, the quality of the data also depends on the intended use of the data. So it is uh, of very important, uh, it is very important to define, you know, what do we want to use the data for in from there, and then we can actually backtrack uh, trace to what kind of data quality should uh, do we require in order to uh, make that happen. And on the right hand side here, and you can see a 
an example of uh, the assessment overview we provided. So by looking at the uh, data sources and we can provide the scores for what is the current state of the data quality and what actions do we need to do in order to improve the data quality. So with the data uh, in, uh, quality in mind and uh, and design a good data lake. And then when we start to pulling uh, up the team, and uh, there are a couple of key roles we would like to uh, enforce in the, in the project. So we, we would like to have the project lead who owns the project and uh, define the priorities, et cetera. And the domain expert who knows quite a lot about the, their data and what tricks in, in order need, uh, uh, we need to do in order to, to use the data. And then we can uh, come up with, uh, we can come with uh, Data engineers, the data scientists. So, the data engineer will build the uh, pipelines and the whole infrastructure to carry the data from one end to another. And the data scientists that can work on the algorithm and modeling in order to derive insights from that data. If we have uh, uh, heritage systems or, or current system running at the moment, and we may need the application consultant in order to glue these two solutions together or combine this uh, in, a smart, in a smart way. And this is uh, actually the bare, uh, bare minimum setup we would like, and depending on how large scale the application can be, uh, we may need uh, UI and backend developers or squad masters, et cetera, in order to make this work. When it comes to, uh, to work with the teams, and we start to uh, adopt uh, ML ops principle. Compared to the conventional DevOps circle, what we have at the beginning is the ML circle. So the first iteration on the ML circle is to validate whether the data can deliver the value that meets business requirements. If, if not, then we feel fast. We don't roll out into uh, DevOps circles. If that uh, uh, is uh, approved, then we quickly roll into the DevOps circle here. And then these three circles can start to interplay with each other. And on the right hand side is a more detailed view on uh, how, do, how do we do it uh, in practice. So this is just a reference, uh, used as a reference, and uh, we will adapt this uh, architecture on the way depending on the use case. But we always would like to check the data. So the sanity checks on the data, qualities, et cetera. And after that, we can orchestrate uh, machine learning computer resources such as workspace, compute, pipeline, et cetera. And then this can be wrapped up in the issue develop build pipeline to ensure reproduci reproducibility and uh, easy maintenance. And then the data scientists uh, can focus on train the model, invent the model, and register the model when they are happy with the model uh, results. And then uh, the model can be pushed to a model management service. Depending on the use case, uh, we can either consume the model as the Docker images or web services uh, deployed on different uh, uh, computer engines. If we have a very large uh, and a frequent uh, uh, load on the, um, on, the, on the model, and then we, we can deploy it to Azure Kubernetes services. And this uh, process will go uh, in an iterative manner so that the week we will iterate the solution to the stage that uh, satisfies uh, uh, the business. So this is, uh, uh, these are the few uh, key, key tools and we use in order to guide us to do a proper uh, production use case. And next part, I'm going to show you two use cases that we use in business so that uh, uh, bring, um, bring better business intelligence. So here, when I talk about, when I talk about the argument of business uh, to mental intelligence, there are actually two very important uh, uh, pillars. So the first one is the algorithm, al algorithm side. So we can use the algorithm in the right way. And the second part is actually on the business and domain understanding. So these two, we cannot uh, uh, neglect uh, uh, either of them and they should go hand in hand if we want to put a, a automated solution in the end to realize the business value. So the first case I'm going to bring you is uh, to use machine learning and deep learning to enable content uh, personalization. So in this project, uh, the idea is to uh, to provide a personalized user journey for our our uh, digital customers, meaning that when they start to get in touch with our websites or other um, digital touch points such as the apps, and then there 
uh, user behaviors uh, can be locked, and then we can use uh, we can use machine learning in order to derive the int uh, intelligence we want. So in this case, we are particularly interested in the job role. And when we have a very high confidence on the job role, then we can push the user uh, to uh, to the user experience engine. And then when they visit us uh, again, and we can put, provide uh, personalized user experience to them. So the reason that uh, in this project we are uh, very interested in job role uh, will be clear in the in a moment. And the end game of this project is to uh, increase the customer satisfaction so that when they are visiting our website, we provide the content they need in time. So the reason why we focus on the job role is because in Groundforce, actually, the customers or more than 90% of its customers are not end users. So they can be operation manager, facility manager, or they can be installer, system builder, consulting engineer, and the distributors. So they have a, a very um, specific domain knowledge and they are expert on their own areas. So when they come to our website, they typically have a very specific purpose on what do they want to get out. So that's, it is our job to meet their uh, request so that uh, enable they have a pleasant journey when they are visiting our website. So the success story in the end we want to invalidate is that for, uh, for example, for consulting engineers, then they can see uh, banners like this. And for, uh, for uh, installers, then they can start their journey, journey uh, from uh, user pages like this. And for distribu distributors, uh, then they will see something else. So when we start to, when we get the, uh, the basic business understanding and, and uh, you know what is the goal, and then we start to massage our data. And there are uh, actually quite a lot of uh, practical issues in the data set, so that uh, forbid us from doing uh, from the forbid us from doing machine learning from the right beginning. For example, the website can build on different uh, platforms. The data collection techniques and tools they may change over time, and the content is also ever incre increasing and the data can be corrupted as well. So we use the data analyst in the loop for sending checks to rule out uh, these issues as early as possible. So when we get the, in, we, when we get the features uh, in our hand, and we found out that uh, actually there are quite a lot of redundancy and collinearities in the data. So we have done some correlation analysis uh, to uh, remove this. Some uh, other factors, for example, anomaly user behavior. So it can be bots crawling our website, or it can be our system engineers that is testing our website. So we want to, uh, to remove these, uh, uh, these records from our training data so that it don't pollute our algorithms. So the feature validity is uh, also another issue. If you take a particular um, feature, and, and uh, you know, we, sometimes we see that uh, uh, different values actually correspond to the same thing. So in order to, uh, to make sure that, uh, in order to um, guide our algorithms uh, in a right track, and we do some feature cleaning up and the feature engineering in order to uh, guarantee the, the feature quality. And we also see feature diversity in our use case as well. And we have the context-based features and also click stream-based features. So the context-based features, so they can stay the same within the uh, same visit or even multiple visits. And the click streams features, uh, they can typically change uh, as we go on the way. And uh, we also see very high cardinality of features. And we see many features, actually, they are categorical as well. So then we need to proper deal with this before we do any machine learning. So the reason to, uh, why we have a high cardinality is because uh, Imagine that you know the if uh, one feature is used to lock uh, you know the uh, the URLs the user visited, and due to the vast majority of the uh, the vast uh, um, ocean of content, and this can have very high uh, cardinality. And some of, some uh, because some of the pages are more often viewed, and many pages uh, they can become outdated and uh, very few visited. So then we decide to actually remove some noise and do feature encoding on the way. And we also have issues with the data label label quantity and the, and the imbalance. So the label quantity means that 
uh, at the very beginning of the project, we actually don't have uh, many uh, labeled data. So that uh, mm, because when they when the users are visiting our website, they can choose voluntarily to tell us what is their job role or not. So at the beginning, we have to rely on a a small training data set, and we are thinking about how do we bypass this. And then, then we look into the literature on active learning and get some inspirations so that we can uh, accumulate the training data on the way. And the, for the, when we have the label, and there's another challenge is actually the imbalance of the label, meaning that uh, you can imagine some user profiles that they can visit our website much more often than others. So uh, we need to uh, proper balance this when we train the algorithm so that the algorithm will not become biased to one type of job, job role uh, than another. So something techniques here uh, comes into play to, um, to avoid this uh, issue. And we tried to uh, validate our, uh, our assumptions on different sites of algorithms. On the left hand side, you will see a couple of examples on the classical machine learning algorithms. And for a long time, uh, when we uh, uh, don't have uh, much training data, and the random forest has been you know, a leading horse in production. And uh, uh, as uh, we started to gather much more and more uh, training data and uh, predict uh, more users with uh, high confidence, and then we can start to use the deep learning models uh, like uh, CNN or other types as well, LSTM, et cetera. So here is a benefit that we can see the power of data where when you have uh, more and more training data, and then it makes it possible to train deep learning models, and also the models are more are better performing and more robust. Another learning in this process is on the feature engineering part. So for classical machine learning algorithms, we all know that they are very much needed. And in the uh, clickstream data, I would say that it's uh, even more demanding because uh, there are quite a lot of user noise. So we need to do proper feature engineering. For deep learning models, in principle, we could get rid of the feature engineering step if we have uh, all the data in the world that can reflect uh, every angle of the user behavior. But that's typically not a use case. We are still live in a very limited uh, training data set. Thus, uh, we found out that you know, to do some uh, lightweight feature engineering that can actually help the, uh, the deep learning model uh, to, to get a better performance and then actually reduce the demand on the quantity of the uh, training data as well. So this is one of the uh, architectures we tried in this project. So when the, when the data is locked from different uh, digital touch points into our data lake, then we split the data into two tracks. So the first track is on the content, uh, context of the context-based uh, features. And the second type is, uh, is the click-based features. So the context features I mentioned before, it can stay the same within a visit or even within uh, multiple visits. So we use a uh, uh, multi-layer multiple layer, uh, perceptual neural network to, to deal with a feature like this, and we trace an or LSTM in order to capture the dependency between the, uh, between the clicks. And in the two uh, fully connected layer, in the end, we want to capture the relationship between the context and the clicks. Um, features, the, the, the dependency between these two types of features before we predict the job roles. And for this solution, and we use a, a, a data factory to orchestrate the whole pipeline, and we use the data bricks and the Spark in order to process the data and do feature engineering. And then we use PyTorch to build the machine, uh, machine learning models and deep learning models. And we use MLflow in order to track the uh, performance of the, uh, of the model. And then we use uh, Azure DevOps and Git in order to version the code and uh, make uh, build the pipelines, etc. So when we start to test the algorithm, we want to see that what kind of features actually uh, makes uh, uh, contribute to that uh, prediction. So we tried different. Uh, we looked into the literature on interpretability, and the Sharp is one of the tools we use here. For example, if you can see here uh, the the, the algorithm is actually trying to predict uh, four uh, different classes. And you can see that the, the, it, for label two here, it has uh, a much higher 
um, prediction probability compared to other classes. And the right, uh, uh, the right symbols here shows what factors uh, actually pulling up the prediction probability and the blue ones uh, is actually to push it down. So um, by looking at uh, uh, this, uh, some example of this, then the analyst can gain some confidence uh, on whether the algorithm is doing the right thing or is just doing some random guesses. And they can also verify this with their domain knowledge to see um, should they trust the algorithm or not. So our learnings on this way is uh, sharp actually is uh, uh, is quite a good tool. It usually provide, provides a more robust interpretation than LAMP or other tools. So in fact, uh, Sharp actually collect, uh, connects um, LAMP and the Sharply values. And the Sharp, uh, what, uh, uh, another nice thing of Sharp is that it can interpret both classical and uh, machine learning, uh, classical machine learning and deep learning models. For pictures, uh, uh, picture like uh, um, inputs, and they actually provide a quite a good uh, interpretation. But in our case, for the, for the user clicks, uh, sometimes it can be difficult to, to see, you know, uh, uh, to get the meaning out. And for, uh, it is uh, difficult uh, also to, to interpret uh, the multi-input model, for example, the one I showed before. And Sharp can be time consuming, but if you, uh, you uh, use algorithms like uh, decision tree or random forest or XGBoost, et cetera, those kind of methods, then it actually have a faster implementation. So uh, that's uh, all on the first project that we have, uh, uh, we have been uh, focused on. And the second part, I will take you to uh, the second use case, which is uh, forecasting and skill in supply chain management. So the, the the uh, goal of this project uh, is to increase forecasting accuracy and reduce bias for our statistical forecast. So this is a, a quick uh, overview on the setup um, process uh, within Groundforce. Setup stands for Supply Inventory Operation and Planning. And uh, uh, for in our case, the statistical forecast is actually at the very early stage of this uh, process before and the input is uh, fed into uh, demand review and the supply review. So the demand uh, planning process uh, is actually a monthly running process with a defined uh, data model and some uh, uh, particular calculation rules. And in, uh, uh, for in this project, our key focus area is uh, actually to use the current uh, data model and also uh, take into account the method that they choose. And we want to explore what other uh, models we can use or uh, advanced techniques to, so that we can improve the statical forecast. So now we have uh, mm, uh, at least a better understanding on what the project is about, and then we were hit by this. So prediction usually is very difficult, especially about the future. So mm, in our case, what is more, even more difficult uh, is uh, caused by the following challenges. So the uh, currently, we already have a running uh, business process to make the uh, statistical forecast, and we are actually make a new solution that, in the short short term, need to be coexist with the current solution. So we need to. So that's the system integration part, which need to be taken into account when we design the uh, final solution. And for the number of time series, uh, and it actually has a very large quantity. So it, uh, we need to forecast more than 50 time series in, a, in different company code and the product combination. So in order to, uh, to, uh, to make a predi prediction for each sales company, et cetera. So this uh, limits our capability actually to manually process each of the time series and to see you know, what can we do with that time series. We need to think about uh, how do we scale the solution to such a large number of time series at the same time. And the time series by itself, the characteristics uh, is also not uh, in favor uh, to us. So the, we see quite a lot of lumpy uh, time series, erratic time series, even a smooth time series in our case, and uh, many times they don't show clear patterns. So on top of that, the product can be in uh, different phases of their life. For example, they can be in a product launch or phase out, uh, phase out uh, phases. 
and we only have monthly observations on the uh, on the data as well. So this limits the amount of historical data we can use in order to train the model. Since we have a very large portfolio of products within Groundforce, and we have actually quite a deep product hierarchy need to be deal, dealt with. So here I will show you some of the uh, examples to, uh, to, um, to illustrate uh, more on the challenges. And uh, uh, on the left hand side here, you will see a very um, simplified uh, illustration on the product hierarchy. So each, node, each circle here or each node here uh, will signify a time series. So that means uh, you know there will there is a time series associated for uh, a sales company and the comp and the product uh, product uh, combination. And on the lowest level here on level seven, actually we have more than fifty thousand time series need to be taken care of. And if you look at each time series here, and we can see many examples of the time series are very lumpy, and we also see quite a lot of erratic uh, time series. And uh, for the time, uh, for the smooth time series, uh, many of them we don't see clear pattern. With these challenges in mind, and we designed the uh, the final solution architecture like this. So when our data is in a data lake, and we first do the quality assurance, and then after that we uh, do a calendar transformation. Now I will explain it in detail in the next slide why we are doing this. And for the foreca forecasting step. It was actually very difficult for us to find the winning solutions for different type of time series. So we proposed to use a ensemble method so that we can ensemble uh, different uh, forecasting techniques, for example, auto RAMA, auto ETS, uh, TAPAS, uh, theta models, etc. And we also use the uh, HTS forecasting techniques because uh, in our problem we have a very rigorous uh, uh, hierarchy and we want to explore that. We want to use the HTS uh, um, technique in order to improve the forecasting we made in the previous uh, step. And since uh, um, the time series at the top layer of the, um, of the hierarchy are more stable and easier to forecast, and we only apply this HTS on the top part, and we disaggregate uh, the, the prediction to lower levels in the next step. And after that, we do the calendar transformation again, and we make the prediction results ready to be integrated with the current system. And the whole solution is uh, orchestrated by uh, Data Factory, and we do unit testing for each of the components, and we do the integrated testing when different, uh, different uh, services are ready uh, to be integrated, and we do system testing when this solution is ready to integrate with the current solution. So there are many, many things we tried in this project, and uh, uh, on the left hand side, these four definitely uh, in favor of us. And for the uh, calendar transformation, the main logic of using that is that uh, if you look, if we can recall the properties of a time series, we see maybe some of these uh, uh, behavior is caused by the by a certain month simply have more number of working days than others. So if we use the calendar uh, information or number of working days to normalize the time series. Then we perhaps have a have an easier time series to forecast. And for the model example, this is also a winning solution in the end because we try to uh, find there's no uh, we found out that there's no uh, winning you know algorithm that can rule it all. So that's we we use the ensemble method and try to do some smart ensemble in the end. For the HTS, it is also quite good, quite nice in our case because of the hierarchies we're using. Um, and uh, this is very nice te uh, technique that can explore the relationships between different time series within the uh, within the uh, hierarchy. And we, uh, in our case, as you can see, that uh, because of characteristic of our time series and many of the lower lower levels, they are actually very difficult to forecast. Thus, we uh, try to um, use HTS on the top layer of the uh, the top few layers of the um, hierarchy. So that we can make a reliable forecast there and do a disaggregation based on the forecast values for um, at the lower levels, so that we can improve the forecast values there. And we also tried to use uh, many different outlier uh, cleaning techniques, uh, and it uh, actually introduced quite uh, quite some barriers to our uh, results. 
in the end, we decide to, to not use uh, outer layer uh, techniques. Then transformations such as the box, uh, box Cox transformation did not uh, bring much benefit either. And we were thinking about uh, uh, to classify and uh, uh, clustering our time series uh, so that we can assign proper models to each class. And uh, it was also very difficult to find a winning solution for each class. So in the end, we decided to use the model ensemble method so that it provide a more, a much more stable results in the, in the pro prediction process. Machine learning and the deep learning models, they are also widely used for time series forecasting these days. And we uh, researched uh, a bit on the literature and try to uh, test whether you know, the winning solution for M4 condition can be used in our case. And uh, when, we, when we tested it out and we didn't see much improvement on the performance, Thus, we go to, to production with a much simpler solution. So this, uh, this is uh, all for the two use cases. And uh, I would like to conclude my talk with uh, the airplane framework uh, we're using in order to accelerate uh, um, machine learning and deep learning solutions in production. So the, in this framework is actually divided into a few uh, phases. So the early phase will be that we collect the ideas and validate the ideas and set, set up you know, the team and the ownership, et cetera. And when that is done, we move to alpha phase where we can quickly test whether these features can be used to deliver the accuracy or classification accuracy that we need in order to meet the business requirement. When that is done, then we can move to a beta phase if it can prove, prove the business value in alpha phase. And then we can reach a lean technical production, build the bare minimum component that uh, can be validated in the business process before ramping up and uh, to full scale plan production. I also share a few uh, of these uh, CICD principles we use uh, here. It's not an extensive list, but some of the very basic ones we use when we do code uh, for production. And uh, that concludes my talk. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm very welcome to answer your questions. I can see that there are a couple of questions here. Yes, so I will just take them. Uh, um, I will take them uh, one by one. So there's a question on is Git mandatory or can we use any other source control tools? Um, I think yeah, this is uh, this is uh, um, a tool uh, to choose by yourself. So it's not mandatory that that you use Git, but Git is uh, definitely the most popular tools at the moment on the market, and we have uh, quite good experience uh, of using it. So that's uh, in, in our context uh, and in our company. So we choose to use Git, uh, you know, as a as a you know a guiding line for starting a project. Uh, and there's also questions, uh, does it have any fault, fault dashboards? Uh, yes and no, it, it depends on the, on the business requirement. So if they would like to, to have uh, um, some visuals on tracking the performance and et cetera, and uh, we would like to build them for, for them. But for now, I think uh, the main idea would be that we would like to provide uh, some uh, a basic dashboard for them so that they can gain confidence and track the performance, et cetera, so that they know uh, when there's uh, something wrong with the model. So then they can, uh, you know, they can you know, talk to us and we can figure out together, you know, why things uh, has, uh, has drifted, et cetera. Um, there's also one question on. Can we do this after the IoT gateway for anal analytics, for analysis and data normalization? Uh, yes, I think this is uh, the principle so that it can, uh, it's uh, actually a general principle for you to, to use. And uh, it's, uh, it does not limit uh, you know, what kind of uh, application or what kind of uh, ways uh, you implement this. So you can choose to do this for the IoT, after the IoT gateways, or if you think about the edge computing, et cetera. So on the device, you still may need some kind of DevOps principles and uh, 
code versioning and uh, you know ML ops if you want to push the models to the uh, to the IT devices as well. Um, so uh, there's uh, also a question on what is the minimum uh, hardware requirement for this. So if you are if you are training on the so that depends on the use case. For the two use cases uh, I uh, I talk about, and then they can uh, train you know on the cloud platform. So typically, you will, when we are dealing with the cloud cloud platforms, uh, they have auto scaling compute powers and uh, also the parallelization um, at the disposal. So that means that depending on the volume of data you want, you can scale up and down um, on the computer resources that needed. Uh, if you are thinking about uh, on the IoT edge, and then that will be very limited much uh, on you know what capabilities uh, you know you can have on the uh, on your edge device. For example, in our case, it's be pumps, and typically you know we don't uh, we cannot uh, host uh, too much memory on the pumps, and we need to push very simple and uh, you know very uh, and all compressed neural networks etc. in one way or another in order to get intelligence uh, intelligence there. Uh, I think I have uh, run out, run the question list through. So if you have any further questions, and uh, please uh, um, connect me on LinkedIn or, or other ways, so we can also talk uh, offline. And there's also a question on uh, email uh, slides. Um, I, uh, I'm not sure how to get the emails, et cetera, but uh, it's possible if you want to have uh, a reference. Uh, if there's no more questions, I would like to thank you all uh, for the participation and uh, uh, reach out if you have uh, uh, some other things you want to discuss offline as well. So uh, thanks very much for today.